Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to our uh, QFARM session today. Um, so I'm very happy that today we have uh, Jeff Pride. Um, Jeff um, is uh, head of uh, Quantum Optics and Information Lab at Griffith University and Deputy Director of Griffith Center for Quantum Dynamics. He's also executive member of Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. Um, his research interests um, encompass photonic quantum information, uh, quantum optics and measurements, which I think he's gonna talk about some of these today. Uh, I'm very grateful that he could join us today. Um, he's um, joining from Australia, which is early in the morning and from Brisbane right now. Um, and yeah, please Jeff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be joining you today and to be talking about um, the work from my lab, um, which as Fahid said, is the Quantum Optics and Information Laboratory in the Centre for Quantum Dynamics at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. So the work I'm going to talk about today is funded by the Australian Research Council, which I guess is a bit like Australia's version of the NSF. And part of the work is um, funded through the Centre for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. Um, oh, I just sort of got a small technical problem here. Sorry, maybe before you uh, hit off, I'm just going to also mention about the questions. So um, uh, maybe we can leave all the questions for the end of the talk, unless there is some very pressing question, maybe you can then um, uh, interrupt and go ahead. But uh, we're going to leave the questions mostly for the end. Yep, I'm just going to try again. I just had a little bit of a uh, advancing the slides problem. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, here's the uh, requisite slightly out of date uh, group photo. These are the people who've uh, done large parts of the work um, that I'm going to talk about um, today. And I'll mention uh, their names at different points as we go through uh, the talk. Um, so today, um, this talk is going to be a little bit of an uh, unusual one for me in the sense that uh, I'm not going to be talking about um, the topic that's, I suppose, been the main part of our lab's research for the last few years. Uh, but I do want to talk about that just a little bit uh, briefly at the beginning to give you a little bit of a flavour of that. Then I'm going to go on and talk about a topic that I haven't uh, talked about much uh, recently, even though it's been, I guess, a theme of ours, um, one of the themes of our labs for a few years. So first, um, the other stuff. Um, we, we work in, in quantum optics and specifically in photonic quantum optics. So we're interested in, in FOX states, uh, single photons, entangled photons, things like that. And uh, although, of course, uh, many people, including people at Stanford, are interested in uh, using single emitters uh, to create high fidelity um, single photon and similar states, um, our work is around using spontaneous parametric down conversion. Uh, and in particular, we're interested in making, um, you know, photon states. Um, where when you generate um, a pair of photons uh, spontaneously conserving energy and momentum through the SPDC process. We're interested in um, the case where when you herald on one of those um, photons, um, then you can uh, produce the other photon with very high um, heralding efficiency, by which I mean the probability um, that one can collect and detect um, a signal photon conditioner on, conditional on heralding uh, the idler photon. Now, one of the reasons that uh, it's good to work on SPDC um, is because you can make um, incredibly pure uh, photons in incredibly well-defined modes. And so this can be a really high quality source of photons for um, challenging um, quantum information experiments um, that use photonic quantum optics. Uh, the other part of the picture in our lab is using um, ultra high efficiency uh, superconducting nanowire detectors and uh, in order to do this, we collaborate with uh, the group of Sewu Nam at NIST and also the group of Sven Roger at uh, Center for Quantum Computation and Communication uh, Technology. And I'm not going to say much about those detectors, I'll say a little bit now about the sources. Um, so uh, basically these sources are really uh, about doing high quality mode engineering. Uh, in a sense, it's classical optics and nonlinear optics uh, with um, the application then that we're running this at the single photon level. Um, and uh, 
by designing um, the spectrum, uh, both the spatial and the frequency spectrum of the pump, uh, the properties of the pole nonlinear crystal and various other properties of the system, uh, we can sort of simultaneously achieve uh, very high uh, visibility non-classical interferences and start us slightly out of date, we're a bit better than that now, and also very high um, heralding efficiencies. So I should just say that these heralding efficiencies um, include the detector efficiency. So this is uh, not only um, the probability of collecting that heralded photon, but even detecting it. And so uh, given that our detector efficiencies are around about 90%, that value of 84 or now 85, 86%, um, is, is really largely just limited by um, the detector efficiency. Uh, the reason that we're interested in um, making these kinds of sources is that we want to be able to do um, kinds of quantum information experiments um, that with optics that are at the challenging edge. So although people have been able to realize real quantum advantage with squeezing um, for a long time in a continuous variables, homodyne detection kind of setting, it's really only been recently that with photonic entangled states, by which I mean entangled Fox states, like noon states, uh, that we've been able to uh, unconditionally surpass the shot noise limit. Um, and um, uh, as well as that, we're interested in, in applications in sharing entanglement over long distances. So here's an example uh, where we use um, an entanglement swapping architecture essentially um, to basically um, close the detection loophole in a non-locality test, the so-called quantum steering test, um, where we share um, entanglement through a lossy channel over a long distance and essentially using uh, entanglement swapping uh, to herald the presence of that entanglement and uh, mean that we can verify the presence of that non-locality with the detection loophole closed. So these are quite challenging experiments that require um, high performance sources. We're also interested in, in um, fundamentals. Um, so for example, uh, looking at this quantum steering non-locality task, it's an asymmetric task where uh, the two parties involved, Alice and Bob, uh, make different assumptions. Uh, there and uh, in the cartoon, it looks sort of more like a, a Harry Potter movie than, uh, than, than, uh, than, than a quantum experiment. But uh, the idea is, is that Alice and Bob share some entanglement. But because of the properties of quantum steering, in principle, it's possible that um, the non-locality no, non task can be asymmetric. And uh, we conclusively demonstrated that indeed um, that, that can be the case. Um, and other fundamental applications, like a recent result where we looked at a no-go theorem uh, for Vigna's friend uh, with our theory collaborators, Howard Wiseman and Eric Cavalcanti at Griffith, and uh, able to sort of do experiments, um, you know, doing a proof of principle sort of verification um, of, this, of this new theorem. So um, these are the sorts of things that we do uh, and that we tend to talk about quite a lot um, in our talks. Um, but today, I'm not actually going to talk any more about those things. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about a um, topic that really concerns the notion of complexity in quantum physics. And I'm thinking about, you know, statistical complexity here, um, you know, the information complexity of systems. And uh, I guess this sort of leads to the title of the talk, which is looking at um, sort of different kinds of quantum advantages um, that one might get through using quantum systems for information science. Um, so when we think about quantum computing, which is uh, perhaps the real flagship of quantum information processing, uh, we're used to the idea that um, uh, the quantum speed ups that we usually hear about are basically exponential speed ups in processing time. Uh, things like Shor's algorithm or quantum chemistry simulating quantum systems, uh, we're really looking at uh, you know, a temporal speed up in solving some kind of hard problem. Um, but of course, there are other sorts of advantages um, that one might achieve as well. And so today I'm gonna to talk about how we can use quantum systems to achieve um, a memory advantage uh, in, in the memory that's required in stochastic simulation and modeling, um, a quantum communication advantage in distributed processing, so-called communications complexity, um, and a resource reduction in processing um, statistical distributions. So these are all sort of quantum advantages that one might achieve that are a little bit outside of um, the things that we perhaps typically uh, think about. So 
Um, because that's a few topics, uh, firstly, I'm going to just give the broad idea of, of each of them, uh, maybe a bit of context, uh, and then I'm going to come back and talk really just about the first two um, in, in a little bit of detail. Um, but even then, um, really just cutting, cutting to the chase. And I suppose the overall thing that I'm aiming for today um, is to give you a flavour of um, these particular uh, topics, uh, the sorts of things um, that are interesting in them, the experiments that we've done so far. And also I'd be interested to hear, um, you know, any ideas that one might have about, um, you know, where, where these things could go um, in the future. So um, that's where we're heading today. All right, so first uh, let's talk about memory in stochastic simulation. Okay, so we're used to physical systems that uh, appear deterministic to us. So things like uh, trajectories described by Newton's laws. And on the other hand, we're used to systems that are completely random. Uh, something like a fair coin toss or maybe even a fair quantum coin toss, if you will, uh, where we think that um, randomness uh, is somehow inherent to the problem. But of course, that there are systems that fit uh, sit at various different points along this uh, spectrum. And so there are some systems um, like the weather and the stock market where we can see some sort of determinism in them, but there seems to be a random element as well. Whether that's uh, a truly random element or whether that's uh, just some uh, level of complication that we can't uh, deterministically model uh, is sort of irrelevant actually for most of the, the situations that we consider. Uh, because uh, it looks like uh, randomness, randomness to us. And indeed, we don't need to go know what's going on inside the box. We can really think of these systems that we want to model as somehow being like black boxes um, that produce uh, statistics, data, information of, on some sort of uh, random or semi-random variable. And we can group that data into uh, what you might call the past, the data that we've collected so far about the system, and the future, um, the events that are going to happen over the next time steps uh, as, as the system in interest under consideration, the weather or whatever it might be, uh, continues to, to evolve. Um, and so um, we're interested then, of course, not only in observing these systems, but also in modeling them. Uh, can we reproduce uh, samples of the kinds of statistics uh, that they would uh, uh, give us? And so in order to do that, we need some sort of model, okay? And so the idea, I guess, is that if we can have a, a model that uh, describes the system at some time T1, when that system later evolves to time T2 and uh, produces some output, uh, we want our model to be able to do the same thing. And we want our model to be able to produce statistically equivalent data to the system under consideration. Now I say statistically equivalent because this is um, stochastic data. So it's unlikely that uh, each bit of, of input is going to be identical uh, between a system and a model. But if they're statistically identical, uh, then we can say that the model is a good one. But we can take that even a bit further because a model is a, a mathematical construct. In fact, in order to implement that model, we need some sort of physical simulator, some sort of platform on which we can run the model in order to produce um, the output. And again, we want the output of that simulator um, as we tick along through time uh, to be equivalent uh, to that of um, yeah, the underlying system. So the question that we ask in, the, in these memory and, and statistical complexity questions is how much memory does the simulator require? And here's the key question, does it depend on the encoding? That is to say whether our simulator has a memory that's a classical memory or a quantum memory. And I'm going to come back to that, but you can probably already guess that the answer is that of course it does depend uh, on the type of memory. I'll say a bit more about that soon. The second topic um, that I'm going to introduce you to is the notion of communication complexity. You've probably heard about this already before, um, but communication complexity is really about doing joint information processing tasks between separated parties. So here we have Adam, Bob and Charlotte and uh, my group member Nora uh, picks, picked these pictures because they're people looking grumpy at communication devices. And so this is meant to somehow capture the idea that, um, uh, that they're trying to do a task, um, which is a shared task, but they want to minimize the amount of communication uh, that, that is passed between them because communication is some sort of hassle. 
So these three parties will each hold some information. Uh, perhaps we can represent that as, as a bit string in each case. And they have to compute some function, which depends on um, all of the information um, that is distributed uh, amongst them. Uh, and so uh, one then asks the question, how can they do that most efficiently? Um, and uh, sometimes uh, we can consider problems where not only it's about how much communication there will be, um, so the naive thing, for example, is Bob to send all his information to Charlotte and Adam to send all his information to Charlotte, uh, and then she uh, just evaluates the function. Uh, but that might not be the most efficient way to do it, or there may be some other constraints on the problem that make that uh, impossible. Okay, so maybe that's not the best thing that can be done. And the question then is, um, given, given the, the structure of the problem, the function that needs to be evaluated, any other constraints that we might have, what is the minimum uh, amount of communication uh, and the, the pattern of communication that's going to make this possible? Uh, so, for example, um, uh, the framework then is that there's a distributed uh, information processing task, perhaps with some conditions. The aim is to try to uh, evaluate that function or complete the task as successfully as possible while minimizing the communication. And we're interested in the scaling of that communication size. So there's two things that we could do. We could say, um, if we have a quantum advantage, uh, maybe that would lead to a higher success probability for a fixed amount of communication. A higher uh, or a lower error is another way that one could think of that. Or the flip side is that there's a fixed success probability or error, um, and then we try to minimize the amount of communication. And in particular, uh, we're thinking about how one might um, uh, consider the scaling of um, the communication uh, as the size of the inputs uh, increases. And so, uh, as in all of these cases, uh, what we'd really like to see um, is an exponential improvement, uh, if that's possible, but, um, you know, some other sort of quantum improvement would also be interesting. Okay, so the third of our problems uh, that we want to consider is the so-called um, Bernoulli factory. So a Bernoulli factory is something that transforms the statistics of, of probabilities. Um, and so specifically, uh, mathematically, the problem is often phrased in this way, uh, that we take a coin or several coins with bias P, P is the probability that they'll come up heads, and uh, we create a coin um, with some other bias, F of P, where F is a function that's um, given to us. Uh, so, for example, uh, we're interested in saying, how can we take a you know, coin uh, with whatever bias it has and turn it into a different um, probability distribution there? So this is a fundamental mathematical problem that people have worked on um, relatively recently. And it, it has application in Monte Carlo techniques because uh, this is about how you can uh, sample from different kinds of uh, probability distributions. Okay, so it turns out that um, making some functions um, is very easy. Uh, if we take the example, and I think this is a case that uh, von Neumann considered way back when, uh, that if you want to make a, uh, have a coin with probability P of heads and you want to make uh, a coin with probability P squared, uh, really you just take two of these coins and you flip them twice. And when they both come up heads, uh, happens with probability P squared, of course, uh, then you call that the heads of the new coin and any other results, uh, one minus P squared probability, um, then uh, that's tails. Okay, so that's a simple one, uh, but not all functions are that easy. And so the questions that mathematicians ask in this space, uh, for which functions is the Bernoulli factor, factory constructible and um, for which, uh, is a Bernoulli function uh, factory efficiently uh, constructible? So this is the question. And I'm not going to say more about this later on. So let me give you the, the answer um, quickly now. It turns out that there are um, some, some uh, functions that are classically inefficient. And so a really key one here is this function, which is uh, often written as fp equals 2p. Now, clearly, that uh, can't literally be interpreted as just 2 times p, because otherwise it would take the value of 2 when p is equal to 1, which is not an, an allowed probability uh, value. So, um, in fact, the mathematicians define it as this kind of triangular function. 
That's 2p over the first half of the range, and then it's sort of 1 minus over the second part of the range. Okay, and it turns out that basically because of the discontinuity in the gradient here at p is equal to a half, this turns out to be a pretty hard function um, to simulate classically. And um, although I haven't gone through um, the mathematical details of this, I believe that it's uh, important uh, because uh, if you can construct this function, then you can construct a multitude of other uh, functions as well. And so we're interested then in are there better ways uh, to be able to um, construct this. I should say, by the way, that the reason it's um, hard uh, to construct um, this mathematically uh, classically is because essentially uh, one defines, uh, you know, polynomials of increasing order that try to fill in that little gap at the top of the triangle. Uh, and it ends up being pretty resource uh, intensive uh, in order to do that. Um, but it's, it's possible to uh, use quantum systems to demonstrate an advantage. And the idea is to use, uh, instead of classical coins, quantum coins. So this is uh, coins um, that are not just in a classical statistical mixture, as a, a classical coin is, uh, as, as it spins through the air, you might say. Uh, but these are coins that are in uh, quantum superpositions. So one can use um, sort of uh, individual uh, qubits or um, systems of qubits. So for example, uh, two qubits and making Bell measurements between them uh, to get a resource scaling improvement. That, uh, that scaling improvement isn't exponential, unfortunately. It's, it's, uh, it's quadratic in theory. Um, but um, yeah, we went off and did this with uh, photonic quantum optics, uh, with um, making uh, Bell measurements on very precise qubit states, also looking at single qubit systems, and we were able to show uh, this advantage for constructing this um, sort of triangle uh, function here. And there's been some other theory work and work in other experimental systems that's been uh, done as well. All right, so for the remainder of the time, I want to dig into the um, first two uh, issues, the memory and stochastic simulation and the communication complexity in a little bit more detail. So I said here that we're interested in uh, the stochastic process models. And uh, we can think of this system then really as being a time series, a collection of random variables indexed by time. Uh, the system has got uh, what we call its past, which is the results that it's previously produced. We can consider these to be bits uh, and its future, uh, which are going to be the results that will happen. And the, um, the probabilistic behavior of these processes are described by the joint probability distribution between um, uh, these two strings. When we come to model these systems, we're really interested in how complex does a model need to be? Uh, what is it um, that is the minimum uh, complexity that the model needs to have? And so we can consider situations, um, of course, where we could construct a, mate, a great many different kinds of models, perhaps, that do give the same statistical outcome. They produce uh, the same statistics, but that they require different levels of complexity. And so if we have two such models, uh, call them one and two, uh, if one of the models requires us to sort of store information about the past that we'll label here by A and B, and the other one only requires us to store information about A, uh, then we'll prefer mathematical model two because the output is the same, but um, the memory that's required to store information to produce that output is smaller. Uh, philosophically, we might also prefer this model because uh, in a spirit of Occam's razor, we might uh, be happier to have models that uh, require um, less uh, causes to determine uh, their results rather than more. Uh, the idea that um, has been developed by uh, Jim Crutchfield and others uh, is that of the uh, Epsilon machine. And so we're thinking about a classical device now that can be a minimal model uh, for producing um, the statistics of these kinds of processes. And the idea is this, if we have all possible past events, um, we could imagine um, two different strings uh, which represent two different sets of past statistics uh, that might have been possibly generated. And let's suppose that although X1 and X2 are different, they have statistically identical futures. That is to say, regardless of whether we're in the condition described by X1 or X2, uh, the statistics from this point onwards are going to be the same. 
Well, it turns out then that any difference between X1 and X2 is irrelevant um, for determining the future statistics. And so information that we hold about the difference between X1 and X2 um, is, is useless information because it can't tell us anything about the future. Uh, and so we can discard that information. And what this tells us then is that we can divide up this space of all possible past events into equivalence classes, where each class uh, really just describes um, what a particular set of future statistics is going to be. And then we could associate a state of uh, the memory, a state of the model, a uh, state of the simulator uh, with these uh, equivalence classes, and we could call those states uh, causal states. So this is the idea of the so-called epsilon machine. And the key idea is that there's no need to distinguish between different pasts if the future is the same. Okay, so if the left-hand box here represents, um, you know, uh, our information in the past and the right-hand one, uh, the information about the future, then what we learn is that there's some sort of mutual information between the past and the future, which is really um, what we need to know in order to produce um, the future statistics. And so this gives us a lower bound on how many bits uh, any simulator of the process must store. Uh, but it turns out that if one uh, looks at these epsilon machines, uh, the classical models, then in almost all cases, uh, the epsilon machines turn out to store more information than the minimum that's mathematically required. Okay, so this uh, number here, which we call C mu, it's, a, it's a, an entropy, it's an amount of information, it's called the statistical complexity, is how much an epsilon machine must, short, must store based on this equivalence class argument. And typically it's larger than um, the sort of minimum amount that's mathematically required. And it turns out that it's been shown that there exists a quantum encoding such that whenever C mu is bigger than E, uh, as in this diagram here, uh, then there's a quantum encoding uh, for which the complexity, that is to say the, the size of the memory, uh, can be smaller uh, than in the classical case. So as I said, these are statistical complexities and I'll show you in a moment what they look like mathematically. So let's start with a very simple example. Let's imagine a pair of uh, switches uh, that um, can take on sort of random values, but together they determine um, the state of some system. So I'm imagining uh, the steps here at my house. Um, there's a light switch at the bottom of the steps and a light switch at the bottom of the steps. And uh, if I turn on either one of them, I can turn the, the light on, on or off. Okay, so uh, that the condition of the light uh, depends on the overall state of the switches, the parity of the switches, you might say. Uh, and we could imagine that uh, over time, people come along and they flick those switches on and off. And if I sort of am ignoring the rest of the environment, this look like, might look like a random uh, process to me or a partially random process. So um, with some probability P, in other words, uh, one of the switches is flipped at each time step. P it's flipped, one minus P it stays the same. But uh, the state of the light only depends on the parity of those switches. So we could take an XOR operation to get that, and then we pass um, the system on to the next time step. Now, in order to model this process, uh, I could model what's the state of both the switches. Are they both on? Are they both off? Is the top one on and the bottom one off and vice versa? But that's uh, clearly two bits of information, but really all I need to know is what's the parity of the system, which is one bit of information. And so this is an example where there is in fact, you know, a preferred model, um, even classically. And the preferred model can be described by a graph that looks like this. It has two causal states, which here I've labeled uh, zero and one, and there's some um, probabilities of transitions between those states um, at each time step. So probability P of changing state and one minus P of staying in the same state. Now we could consider models where there's different probabilities of going in different directions. Uh, that's uh, we can think of other problems like that. We can think of more complicated models that have more causal states and so on, but this gives you the basic flavor. So for this particular simple case, um, the equilibrium state of the system, as long as the, the P's in both directions here are the same, uh, is that the system sort of spends half its time on average uh, in each of these two states, uh, zero and one. And so, of course, uh, even for this simple case, we could ask the question, um, is there a way to use less information um, to store the information uh, quantumly rather than classically? 
Uh, so in, to replace our kind of classical causal states, our bit uh, with some sort of um, quantum states. So classically, uh, these states have to be maximally distinguishable. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, just like in this picture, uh, the difference between the classical zero and one is about as extreme as can be. Um, the two states are at opposite sides of a, of a block sphere, for example. Um, but uh, because they spend, the system spends about equal time in each of these two states, uh, then the probability um, of each is a half. And the average state of the system is just sort of the classically maximally mixed state. Uh, the statistical complexity, as I said, is an entropy. Uh, and so for this particular system that I've described, uh, that is always one except in a special case where P is a half and then you could just randomly flip a coin and you don't need to st store any information, but that's a, a sort of a, a quirky discontinuity. Otherwise it's one for every value of capital P. Uh, and as I said, the overall state is this average state here. Uh, what about the quantum system? Can we find uh, a quantum encoding that has a lower statistical complexity? And the answer is yes, uh, because we can make superposition states. It turns out that if we make um, the states given here, uh, which depend on this transition probability capital P, uh, then um, the average state now is not in the center of the sphere, but it's this state rho uh, given here. And um, uh, obviously, the closer that uh, zero tilde and one tilde get together, um, the more coherent things are going to be, and indeed the more indistinguishable those two states are going to be. And so when they become very indistinguishable, um, the quantum statistical complexity, which is given by the von Neumann entropy, uh, is much, much less than one. And in general, it'll be less than one, uh, except in the uh, case uh, when P goes to zero or one. Okay, so um, uh, we did an experiment to show that indeed uh, you can um, observe uh, this reduction in statistical complexity. And I'm going to skim through the details relatively quickly so that we can move on. But the idea here is that in the classical case, uh, a step of the simulator would look something like this. Um, at the input, you've got the, the model state, the, the memory of, of the system here. It comes in and it's either flipped or not with some probability P. Uh, we can then correlate that state um, with, with an ancilla, uh, which we read out to give us um, the uh, output at that particular time step. Uh, and then the memory is passed on to the next step of the process and we introduce a new ancilla bit, uh, which enables us to do the next time step and this repeats. Uh, when we did this in the lab, uh, which we did with photons just prepared in classically distinguishable states, we sort of actually interrupted this process and measured the sort of the state of the system after each step. So it was a sort of measure and reprepare uh, type protocol, which enabled us to directly quantify, um, statistically speaking, what the entropy of it was. And then we did the similar thing with a quantum system. So here our correlation is done through uh, C0, a controlled X gate. Um, and again, uh, the, the system just passes on. Uh, because the states are non-orthogonal, the, the flipping sort of happens um, inherently in the quantum protocol, just as a result of the measurement back action. Uh, but uh, in, in the lab, we actually did a measure and reprepare protocol. So we could use quantum state tomography in order to characterize um, the uh, entropy of the states. So uh, we modeled one step at a time. And we did that in, in an experiment where we used um, uh, a photonic um, non-deterministic controlled knot gate. So we produced our photons uh, using spontaneous parametric doubt conversion. Um, and uh, we prepared the quantum states using in polarization qubits using uh, wave plates. Uh, then this uh, partial Hongo Mandel interference here, um, conditional on one photon coming out each of the, the final ports, uh, gives us the C0 operation we need. And we're able to measure the output state and also do tomography um, to determine the entropy of the system. So it's a sort of relatively straightforward experiment, but uh, with this we were able to confirm that the entropy, that is to say the statistical complexity, uh, indeed can be much lower in the uh, quantum case uh, than in the classical case where these uh, diamonds here at the top uh, represent the, the classical data. So uh, you, you might object uh, to what I've done and say, well, Jeff, that's all very well, 
Um, there's clearly an entropic advantage uh, in, in uh, these kinds of systems, even in the very simplest case, and one could imagine that it could be maybe more spectacular in, in larger systems. Uh, but what about um, actually the dimensionality? It's all very well to say that the quantum system has a lower entropy than the classical one, but in the classical one, uh, you still needed a bit, and in the quantum one, you still needed a qubit. You needed a two-dimensional system in either case. Isn't it possible um, that, um, you know, uh, that's a little bit artificial? So there's two responses to that. The first one is to say, well, um, in principle, of course, one would really think about running uh, many, many uh, copies of such simulators. And uh, in principle, one could use compression across the many copies um, to achieve a memory advantage in the, in the large scale. So to turn the entropic advantage into a true um, compressive advantage. Although, to be honest, I don't have a constructive technique uh, to do that. Uh, but it turns out that for more uh, complicated processes, indeed, there is also a dimensional or indeed a shot by shot advantage that can often be obtained. Okay, so uh, we can consider a more complicated process and it's a little bit of an artificial one, uh, but not contrived um, for the purpose of this example, contrived for a, for a different thing. Um, and uh, it's a three state uh, system here. Okay, so uh, here we've got uh, three causal states. And uh, the, the, um, on the right hand side of each of those vertical bars tells you the probability of transitioning, um, say down here, it's probability P of transitioning from state zero uh, to state uh, two. Uh, and uh, if that tr transition happens and it gives output symbol two. So there's three output symbols here, three causal states. And uh, classically it needs to be described by a three state system, which therefore requires either two bits or a trit in order to do that. Uh, but the quantum system, which also has three causal states, uh, can be encoded into a qubit, uh, regardless of P and Q, as it turns out. Uh, and so um, without going through the details, uh, we did a more complicated experiment uh, to realize that. And the key point here is that at the beginning of each time step, and then at the end of each time step, and, and here we sort of measure to characterize, but we could pass this on to the next uh, time step, um, the memory here is encoded in a qubit, okay? Uh, these kind of wiggly lines tell us about the dimensionalities of the system. So here, this memory state here in this sort of, you know, pale green color uh, is, is a, a two-dimensional state in the quantum case. So we realized this in, again, in, a, in an optical photonic um, quantum logic circuit. And uh, we asked ourselves, can we produce the correct statistics using the quantum case? And uh, is the correct memory state produced? And do we get the memory savings? And to cut to the chase, the short answer is yes. These are uh, sort of samples of a few different uh, cases of uh, statistical complexity. So for when P is equal to Q and we vary Q or particular values where we hold P at a particular, um, yeah, at a particular value and then change uh, the other, other probability Q. And we can see that in each case, the quantum case given by the data there below, lies below the classical statistical complexity. But even more than that, everywhere you see gray, gray shading on this figure is an example of a case where the classical statistical complexity is such that you couldn't compress even in many, many copies of the system uh, to, to a bit. Uh, it requires at least a three-dimensional system uh, in order to do that. So there's a dimensional advantage that's possible in these systems as well. And so our theory collaborators, uh, Mila Gu and Jane Thompson uh, in Singapore, are looking into uh, you know, sort of larger and, and more kind of uh, diverse examples of, of how these um, dimensional advantages can be realized. But it looks uh, kind of promising that there'll be large families of processes for which this is true. Uh, very, very quickly, um, I just want to sort of skim over um, the case that, um, I mean, although we're using quantum systems for memories here, things still look pretty um, uh, classical. That is to say, regardless of whether we do the classical or the quantum case, uh, we're sort of spitting out a bit of uh, information at each of these kind of different time steps, okay, a classical bit. Uh, and we're sort of very much dividing it up in time in this way. But you could imagine that if we delay these uh, quantum uh, measurement steps here, uh, getting the outputs x1, x2, and x3 in some sort of quantum circuit, uh, so uh, put uh, these detectors for x1, x2, and x3 here at the end, 
uh, then prior to the detectors, uh, there's some sort of uh, superposition state. So in other words, in a classical system, you must uh, take some particular statistical path uh, through the trees of, of particular outcomes, uh, which in the sort of two state system kind of doubles at each time step. Uh, but in the quantum case, uh, one can actually produce uh, a superposition over all the, the possible uh, modeled future statistics. And so for three steps, uh, that would be, um, you know, a superposition uh, of these kind of probability amplitudes times the states corresponding to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And then one might consider an experiment uh, where you do something like that, and then you, you, you have two different simulators and you actually interfere um, the future statistics between these. And by interfering, really what I mean is doing the equivalent of a swap operation uh, to be able to uh, look at the overlap um, or to compare uh, the future statistics um, of two possible um, simulations uh, without actually having to read them out classically. And so this is an experiment we did uh, along these lines. Uh, the encoding in this case was in uh, temporal, temporal modes of the photons. Uh, and uh, you can see these orange and uh, kind of red paths uh, through the experiment. There's actually two simulators sort of side by side or one on top of the other here. Um, they use similar optical elements, but in the end, um, essentially by doing a non-classical interference, which is the equivalent of a swap test, we could compare uh, the overlap between the statistical futures of these processes. And so uh, they uh, look something like this. When they're identical, we're able to see Hongo Mandel or non classical interferences that are of very high visibility. Uh, and then as we change different parameters in the simulation, uh, we're able to see that, you know, overlap uh, between different processes change in a way that's uh, pretty similar to, to what we'd predict for these sort of simple uh, two state processes, but now with them. Um, uh, different probabilities of, of conversion. Okay, so um, a question that we might ask ourselves is, is what is this useful for? Um, and uh, I guess uh, a sort of a speculative uh, idea here is that maybe some sort of, uh, you know, quantum AI or quantum machine learning could update its quantum memory more efficiently, uh, sort of by being able to um, you know, look at families of processes rather than sort of looking at all, all sort of data. Uh, there are other applications for comparing long strings. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I guess this is an open question as to exactly, um, you know, how, how and what we'll use this for uh, in the future. So in the last few minutes, I want to just say a little bit more about um, communication complexity. Um, and this is an experiment that was done um, in collaboration uh, with um, uh, the team of Fei Hu Xu at USTC Shanghai. He's part of the um, Zhang Wei Pan group of groups. Um, and uh, it's an experiment that we were ramping up to do in our lab. And then um, we realized through mutual collaborators that Fei Hu's lab uh, basically had everything almost ready to go. <laughs> and so um, we, uh, we, we, we teamed up and, uh, and did this experiment. So the idea is um, to do this so-called exchange evaluation game. So this is an example of one of these uh, remote quantum processing tasks, uh, where in this case, um, two parties who we're gonna call Alice and Bob, each hold a string, call them X and Y, a binary string of length N, and they each have a function. It's a function that maps from a binary string of length N onto a bit. Uh, there are some other conditions associated with the game. But the idea is, is that a third party, Charlie, um, somehow must evaluate uh, this exchange evaluation function, which is essentially applying Alice's function to Bob's string and Bob's function to Alice's string, and then taking the sum modulo two of that. And then um, we, we apply a different condition, which may be a little bit artificial, but um, in the spirit of many of these quantum information protocols, it's in this case something that makes it a very interesting game, which is that two-way communication is forbidden. Okay, so we're only allowed to have a system leave uh, each of Alice's and Bob's uh, stations once. So you can't have something that Bob sends to Alice and then Alice uh, sends it back uh, to Bob again later. Okay, so um, 
that makes things difficult, but quantum mechanics gives us a way forward and it's based around this idea of the so-called quantum switch. So this is an idea that's been um, had a little bit of traction um, in the quantum information community recently. It's the idea of using a quantum control signal um, to make a superposition or, or a heralded or a controlled, really a controlled, I should say, um, ordering of two operations. Okay, so uh, if the qubit is in state zero, uh, Alice's operation is done first, followed by Bob's, or if the qubit is in state one, then vice versa. And because our, our qubit is indeed a qubit, our control qubit uh, is a quantum system, then we, of course, we can look at superpositions of those operations. And so this is the key concept of how one can uh, basically beat what you can do classically in the exchange evaluation game. That's because we're going to look at the superposition of these two possibilities and then notice that interfering the control qubit at the end is going to give us this uh, sum modulo two. So I don't have time to go through all the mathematical details, which is a shame because they're quite elegant. But um, uh, the key idea here is that um, uh, What's been shown previously with these quantum switches is that um, if you have such a switch that allows us to control the ordering of these two operations, U1 and U2, and then you um, sort of measure in the diagonal basis on the control, um, then uh, you can make positive and negative superpositions of these two orderings, U1, uh, uh, sorry, U2 first and U1, or U1 first and U2 acting on the uh, target state psi. And because you can make those uh, positive and negative superpositions, that means that you can calculate um, the commutator and the anti-commutator of um, UA and UB. And in fact, um, we have a, a case where if we measure, um, you know, the control qubit in one particular case, uh, then we find um, that we have an anti-commutator case, and in the other case, we have the, the commutator. Okay, and so uh, in order to apply this to the exchange evaluation game, it requires um, noticing, um, which again is the bit I don't have time to talk about, but that uh, we can define uh, UA and UB, these two operations, as uh, in one case encoding um, X at Alice's case and the function G that we want to apply to it at Bob's station. So that's one ordering of the operations. Uh, and then UB is going to Bob first and then to Alice. Okay, and so then when we implement the quantum switched version of that, that essentially determines uh, whether these two operations uh, commute or not. And the problem, uh, the maths of the problem is set up in such a way that they commute if the uh, output should be zero and they anti-commute if the output should be one. And so this enables us to uh, determine uh, the outcome. Now, in order to see an advantage over the um, classical case, which I haven't had time to, to talk about the classical um, uh, uh, complexity, but in, it turns out that in order to see an advantage, um, you actually need quite a high dimensional system. Okay, so we actually need um, a sort of a Hilbert space for the quantum system um, of uh, size two to the n, where n is something like 10 or 11 or 12 or 13. So um, depending on exactly which assumptions you make. Um, and so in this system, we're actually going to use a QDIT, uh, which is a temporal encoding across um, the photon, across uh, these two to the n uh, time bin states. Okay, and the experiment looks uh, something like this. Uh, the key point is here that um, it's really a single photon um, so it's a two photon experiment, but the first photon here just, just heralds um, the state, uh, the presence of a second photon. And then the photon here is then uh, passed into um, via this beam splitter, which you can think of as a control operation, uh, one or two, uh, arm one or arm two, uh, which represent Alice and Bob's um, arms of the experiments. There are various delays can be dialed up in these different arms and they encode uh, what X and Y are, um, the states of uh, Alice and um, uh, Bob's uh, input data. And then there are these phase modulators, which are the things that implement um, the functions according to this uh, formula that allows us to use uh, the quantum switch. The photon, uh, let's say it happened to take Alice's arm first, then comes back around through Bob's station and then comes out at the end and um, you can think of this as Charlie over here uh, reading out um, the final 
uh, value of whether the exchange function had value uh, zero or one. So to cut to the chase, uh, we can look at the uh, transmitted information, the communication complexity uh, of the case uh, of, of this uh, particular protocol. And we can see that uh, theoretically, um, uh, the classical protocol is given by the black curve, which is an exponential. Um, any uh, quantum causally definite protocol, so that is any quantum protocol that doesn't make use of this sort of switching of the time ordering, uh, is given by um, the, the blue curve, which is also an exponential. And uh, uh, the protocol that I described here, um, given by the dashed red line and the data with error bars smaller than the size of the points is given by the, um, the dots. And you can see that when we get to the size n equals 12, um, we can get a, a quantum advantage over the um, uh, classical protocol. And by the way, um, this uh, experiment here uh, doesn't factor out the effects of loss either. So we actually worked pretty hard to, to keep losses down in this particular experiment. The other thing is, is that the, uh, the data is consistent with having an exponential advantage uh, for this particular problem as well, which is kind of interesting because even though it's a, it's a somewhat um, you know, contrived example, perhaps, uh, it's nevertheless, uh, you know, exponential advantages are pretty uncommon in quantum information science. All right, so I should uh, wrap up and say that um, uh, in my lab, we do a lot of work on um, high heralding efficiency photon sources and their applications. Um, but other than advertising that, today I talked instead about um, how we can think about um, the complexity of quantum versus classical resources um, for achieving, um, you know, three different outcomes, Mem memory reductions in stochastic simulation, communication reduction in distributed processing, and resource reduction in processing statistical distributions. Uh, so this is um, work that um, actually we've sort of parked for the moment in our lab. Um, and I guess we're at the stage now where we're, we've we sort of demonstrated the key principles and we're interested in trying to think of new ways to harness these effects. And can we uh, map these onto different problems of interest? We have a few ideas, but um, I'd be interested to hear um, if you have any, because uh, maybe we can then find uh, some other things that we might be able to do in the future. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I'll, uh, I'll stop now and uh, ask if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, so we are open for questions. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. The, uh, this is Steve Harris here. The, um, your last example is a very attractive experimentally. And if I heard you right, that it was going to be one parametric down converter followed by a set of phase modulators. Uh, in in the linear linear an interplay of linear network and phase modulators, how does if you want to enlarge the basis to size n, how many what's the scaling on the number of phase modulators that you need uh, re regarding the size of the basis that you're trying to uh, to attain? And very re you know re related to that is also you're broadening the, what's the speed of these, how much are you broadening the bandwidth with those phase modulators? Uh, and is there any constraints on that? Uh, there are sort of related questions. Yeah, no, thank you. Excellent question. Um, so the good news is that um, the phase modulator is not the limiting factor here. And um, uh, modulo a few bandwidth considerations, um, we can uh, continue to increase this protocol without increasing the number of phase modulators. But there is a cost, as you, as you will have guessed, uh, it's implicit in your question, and the cost is that um, the number of time bins, that is to say, uh, the amount of time that it takes to send a particular bit string, uh, grows exponentially in the particular encoding that we've chosen here. So um, that essentially means um, that the data rate, uh, if we think about it in terms of rates rather than um, counting bits of information, uh, will decrease uh, a little bit drastically as we continue to um, increase n in this particular encoding. Now it turns out that um, there's still capability to take this encoding quite a bit further. Um, there are groups that have done other experiments with even um, larger values of n, although for, for different applications. But ultimately, uh, one would want to think about um, perhaps more of a um, 
uh, yeah, an encoding uh, that doesn't grow uh, sort of uh, exponentially in time uh, with the number of bits. So for example, sending more photons rather than sending one photons in a larger number of, of time modes. The reason that that becomes more challenging is that then the processing becomes harder. So in this experiment, we've got simple processing, a single phase modulator, as you point out, that's great, uh, but the cost is that our time grows, scaling grows poorly. Uh, there are other alternatives where the processing gets harder, but the uh, time scaling is, is better. Uh, in the short term, um, expanding the way we did it is the way forwards. Uh, in the longer term, to scale to problems of truly huge size, um, presumably you run into a, a limit at some point. One a quick comment. The, before I retired, my group made long by photons. That is, you have a choice. I believe you're working with the traditional crystal uh, by pair, paired photons. Yep. Uh, but the other thing you could do is you could make these photons very long. And this, so this is back again, whether you gain anything vis-a-vis -vis the modulator. Do we want modulators that, that put the spectrum underneath the... Uh, the, the, uh, that is the length of the photon defines the bandwidth and how, do, how does the uh, modulator compare to that bandwidth? Do you want necessarily, do you want the modulator faster or slower? Is there any advantage by playing with those, that temporal time scale? Yeah, no, absolutely. You're, you're completely right. I mean, in the, in the model that we have here, um, we're basically having a modulator, which is just giving us binary switching um, on the time scale of each of those time bins, which is um, sort of, um, you know, uh, I can't quite remember, actually, I think it's several hundred picoseconds or something like that. Um, but um, uh, one could have a different thing where you, you look at essentially a frequency encoding. So you just have a single photon. And then as you say, you're modifying the spectrum of that photon with the modulator. And that could put you into a different, um, a different regime where the modulator might have to be uh, faster or slower. So, I mean, I, I haven't thought too much about the um, limitations of the modulator. I'm thinking more about um, sort of, I guess, the limitations of the, the complete temporal length of the protocol. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. We should spend a little bit more time thinking about whether a different encoding, so more thinking in the frequency space um, would, would be a good way to go. Thank you. Okay, I'm actually gonna stop uh, the recording because um, we're at the um, hour limit, but we can stay um, a bit longer uh, if Jeff has time and uh, Keep sure. it, um, okay.